too good to be true. Woo! Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't even know what to say about that, except it's a thing. It's totally a thing. So, that said, I've been overwhelmed with so much spiritual wealth that I got flooded and I didn't even know what to do and got all swept up in, oh gosh, everything's working. My brain isn't used to that. What am I going to do? I have no way to handle this. It's all coming in, everything that I've worked so hard for and eek, I don't know. Is it real? Do I trust it? How do I handle it? Too many people pulling at me. Too many people asking me to look at this and look at this business opportunity and and people asking me to be on the podcast and uh, and I thought, "Oh my gosh. What is happening? I I can't believe it." And yet my whole life has always worked. So the only thing getting in my way was, is and always has been my own mind. There's no hard wiring and reference points for life working on our terms until we train our brain to understand it, recognize it, and allow it to happen without unconsciously, invisibly, self-sabotaging. So this is a huge ordeal. So I did this amazing podcast series with Dr. David Gruder, the psychotherapists to the psychotherapists. However, there is one caveat. He no longer actually does traditional psycho- psychotherapy, thank goodness. Um, and he calls himself a recovering psychotherapist. Uh, or a recovering psychologist. Anyway, we did this amazing podcast series on Evolve Your Money Relationship. And his he's so eloquent and so great with um, wording things so simplistically and powerfully, so poignantly. And then it's just like, pow, 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 lightning strikes. Um So we're talking about uh, the relationship to money and how we live our lives at the level of our wounds, not our wishes, and that whatever is lurking beneath the surface in shadow, uh, which I call the subconscious unconscious mind, like the stuff we can't see. That's what we must locate, distinguish, illuminate so that we can get out of our own way and heal those wounds so that our wishes uh, follow suit. Uh, So hashtag spirit creates wealth. Hashtag wealth creates money. So I did the series with Dr. David And it was something, my forte is getting to the invisible unconscious wounds from childhood. That is my shtick, that's my thing, that's the thing that has completely, utterly saved my life, transformed it in such a way that magic happens all the time, every time, uh, at will. And when I set the intention, hashtag think and grow rich, hashtag Napoleon Hill. Uh, think and grow rich. Yes, with a mere thought. Uh, everything that we're asking for that serves us shows right up. But then watch out for what you wish for. That is what has happened to me as I get clearer and continue to get rid of all the disempowering myths in my unconscious, subconscious mind. Uh, The wishes are coming fast and furious. Now, this has always been the case since I was a child, but I had no idea what I was doing. And it's like winning the spiritual lottery. Um, You know, watch out for what you wish for. And then, you know, we want all this amazing stuff. And then what happens? We get it. And then what happens? We freak out. 
That is the majority of the world's population. And you'll also see that in um, very high level achievers, celebrities, uh, athletes, is when they're doing so well and then something happens. Oh my God, they just did that I, Tanya movie. That is the epitome of wishing to be world-class Olympic uh, figure skater and then sabotaging yourself. If that's not the perfect portrait, I don't know what is. And we all go through that to certain degrees or another. And I absolutely am not exempt. No human being on the planet is exempt, by the way. And so once we did that podcast, uh, just because I specialize in the wounding area, I was able to hear Dr. Gruder and take what he was saying and apply it to my own life. And Eureka, I struck gold, literally, figuratively. Um, I was able to tap into more spiritual wealth. And sure enough, that translated right into money. And not only that, it was so many other things happening all at the same time. And it is a thing. Fear of success. Fear of success. And it's one thing to ask for it. It's another thing to get it. But then it's another thing to sustain it and be happy, joyful, healthy all along the way. So I am here to say it all works. It's a thing. Everything's a thing. And it's never perfect. And it's not always going to be easy breezy, unfortunately. And really dealing with when... We wish for something or we dream about something and we ask for it and we set those intentions. What happens when it shows up and how do we cope with it showing up? Not just cope. How do we live joyously, powerfully, happily, healthily in all of the goodness? And I always had and grew up with Massive amounts of external goodness, wealth, riches. Um, But internally, I was dirt poor. I was highly impoverished. I was destitute beyond measure inside, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. I was empty and lost and broken and wounded, depressed, with suicidal tendencies as a child. So that's quite frightening. So just because I had everything on the outside, there was no guarantee that I'd get anything on the inside. And my youngest sister is the perfect portrait and poster child for that because she was raised in the same household with beyond measure uh, so much external abundance and prosperity, beauty, Um, intelligence, and yet she couldn't reconcile her, her spirit, her mental abilities, her emotional abilities, and she died in 2006. So it doesn't make a difference. No matter how much we have on the outside, there's no guarantee that it's, we're going to feel abundant, wealthy, healthy, wise on the inside. And so, I guess what I really want you all to understand is that all along the way in the journey to our dreams and as they appear and become real and they manifest There's the other side that we need to deal with because it's a side that was all too familiar in my own life. And I hope you don't really have to deal with it, but as human beings, we're all, we're all one. If you have a human brain, there is going to be, even at the smallest, tiniest degree this self-sabotaging fear of success and having your dream or wish come true 
and it's not going to sustain. You're not going to be able to maintain it. So I had to look back at my life and go, oh my God, everything's happening. Everything I've worked for. Now here's the thing. I worked fast and furious, but it didn't seem like fast and furious. But it's been really the past 10 years of really evolving myself and creating and uh, practicing self-love, self-worth, self-respect. And in that, all of a sudden it's clicking in. All of a sudden the rewards and results are showing up in ways that I never thought possible. And then I think, oh no, how do I keep up with this? Is it real? Because I've been hardwired to believe from childhood that no matter how good it gets and how great it is, I will never be happy. I will never have this sense of peace and fulfillment. And that is the root cause. And that's what has been always lurking in the shadows because it's how I was trained early on as a child to have everything on the outside and nothing on the inside. So when everything's starting to come in the way that I want it and and actually what I've been working for and training for all these years, my brain is like, doesn't recognize it. Like, what is this? This is not going to last. This is not going to sustain. Uh, you're not going to be happy. Every disempowering myth from childhood that could ever creep up on me invisibly, unconsciously, is creeping. Creeping, creeping, creeping. And sabotaging me. And trying to sabotage me. And trying to bring me back to what I have known, what has been most familiar, and what has been comfortable or safe. And so this is the the reason for the fear of success, the reason for sabotage is the brain will actually go back to the negative disempowering beliefs and perceptions and, and mind viruses and function from that point, not from the point of the conscious mind wanting, desiring, wishing for, dreaming for. So there's the conscious mind. It's one thing to consciously wish for it. It's another thing to actually be the person you need to be, to do the things you need to do to actually bring all of those dreams into fruition. Oh, this is so deep. There's so much here. Rah, 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 rah. Ah. So uh, the thing I want to focus on more than anything is every time I set the intention to desire something and I would get it like it was right there in my hands. I was actually touching it. So I have two prime examples. I My dream horse is a black stallion. I had this black stallion. You know, it came to me. I just happened to look at the Horse Trader magazine. I saw this picture of this beautiful horse in Malibu. I call up and he said, come look at it. I dragged my boyfriend at the time to go look on Valentine's Day. Uh huh. Well, that was a, a clue right there. On Valentine's Day, I'm like, okay, I'm going to see a horse. I didn't want to see him. I want to see the horse. So <laughs> that's very telling. But anyway, this horse is the love of my life. And I said, oh my God. And I also said to myself, if I see any black markings, I don't want him. I walk up to his stall. He's looking outside the back. He turns around, walks right up to me, and he licks my hand. And I said, oh my God, this is my horse. I want this horse. And the thing is, I didn't have $15,000 to buy the horse, uh, which is a big, big number, by the way, for an untrained horse. Uh, But I said, oh my gosh, this is my horse. And so I told the owner, okay, I want this horse. And he said, okay, great. We'll figure this out. I said, I have money coming. And then a few days later, he calls me and he says, I'm really sorry. I'm selling the horse to somebody else who can buy the horse now. 
and I'm not going to wait. Um, so I'm sorry, but I'm selling the horse to somebody else. And I immediately burst into tears. Like I was crying like a little baby. And I said, okay, I understand. Cry, cry, cry. I, you know, I love this horse and I know you got to do what you got to do. This has been my dream horse. Cry, cry, cry. And I let it go. I was devastated, devastated, devastated. So there's a dream right there in my hands. I did have money coming, but not fast enough. And I, at that time, thought, oh my gosh, I'm not getting my dream horse. I was broken. I was devastated. I was like, oh no, I can't do this. This is too painful. You know, and the saying is, better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. I was like, bah, BS, that's crap. I'm never going to do this again. I hate this. I had my horse. It's not meant to be. Cry. And then at some point, I just had to let it go and just wallow in my self pity and sorrow. And then miraculously, I think a day or so later, the owner calls me and says, I changed my mind. I want you to buy this horse because I know you'll love him the way that I love him and you will give him a good home. He actually chose me because I cried, because I broke down and because he felt that if I were, was that upset and crying over his horse, he wanted his baby that he raised from the ground up to go to me. And not only that, he said, I will work out a payment plan for you and with you so that you can buy this horse. But here's the thing. I'm focusing on when we know it's meant to be ours, when we know that this is serendipitous and that we work so hard and that we desire it more than anything and it's literally, we can touch it, taste it, smell it, hear it, feel it. And then it's looking great. Everything's a go. And then all of a sudden the carpet is pulled right out from underneath us and we're leveled. That's the thing I really want to talk about is when that happens. How many times I've been through wa wanting something so badly, having it in my hands, and then something falls through. And I think, oh my gosh, what is going on? So there's so many times that I've done this where the more I wanted it, the more attached I was to it, the more I clung to it, the harder the process. It always broke down in, at the 11th hour. So that would be my Black Stallion, which has been my dream horse since Black Beauty. And then my ranch, that's another big one. I mean, I had this ranch tied up, ready to go, and one thing after another fell out. The escrow was very long and tedious. I remember having a burning stomach and, I don't know, throwing up a lot because it was so stressful. And I had, like, I knew it was meant to be mine. I knew it. And at every turn, something wasn't working. So I had to go through two appraisals. I had to go through the owner only caring about the bottom line and the price. There was just one thing after another. So the point I'm making is the more we're attached to it, the more we want it to happen, the more we hold on tightly and try to control the whole thing, the more obstacles show up out of nowhere. The more challenges occur, the more hardship appears and you're just like, what? 
How is this even possible? Because it's so obvious that it's meant to be mine. So there's that. And then there is my little miniature horse. Oh my God, so cute. He's like a real life stuffed animal. The cutest thing you've ever seen. Like he looks like uh, a miniature Shetland pony stuffed animal. And that was another thing I wanted so badly. And I had him. You know, I just put it out there for to a couple of people. And then a neighbor said, oh, we have a mini horse for you if you want him. I said, yeah. I went to see him. I said, I'll take him. And then something happened. I don't know. He said, oh, sorry. Somebody else has him or is taking him. I said, oh, no. But I realized I was learning. Oh, I got to let it go. It wasn't meant to be. And sure enough, a few days later or maybe a week later, I got the call. Oh, it didn't work out with the other person so you can have him. And I have him to this day. I still have my black stallion to this day. Now, on the flip side, there have been other things I've asked for that I was not never attached to. I didn't have to have it. I didn't try to control it. I didn't even, most of the time I forgot about it. Those are the times I've manifested one thing after another after another. A car, my truck, my 560 SL in black, convertible, uh, everything that I could, that I wasn't um, so clingy with, so desperate to have, so needy, Uh, all those things just showed up easily, effortlessly. And that's the thing I have to remind myself, that with any attachment and the need to prove something underneath it all by acquiring the next achievement or accomplishment or material good or material thing like real estate, the more headaches show up. I absolutely believe there's a direct correlation to how much we need to prove, control, cling to something. The more dramatic, traumatic, and horrible it is the more devastating it is the more disappointing it is so oh my gosh I'm hope I hope I'm like really having you see this in such a way that it makes a difference in your life because it's so imperative and it's it's the biggest part like I really call this hashtag the best kept secret This is hashtag the real secret is how do we have it show up based on law of attraction and manifest it out of nowhere without worrying about the how as soon as possible? Well, the answer is don't be attached to it. Don't be desperate for it. Be willing to let go. Be willing to give up it happening Be willing to trust the universe. Be willing to trust yourself. Be willing to trust that it wasn't meant to be right now for some greater, more divine purpose and reason. And that's how. Because there is and always has been something greater on the other side of letting go. Of letting go. And this is how we, this is the remedy for, uh, well, the remedy for, I would say, the fear of success. Yes, it's a remedy for everything, but there's the biggest remedy to eliminate unnecessary obstacles and unnecessary stress and worry. Also, by the way, it sucks the life out of us and it creates a lot of domino effect problems, drama. And it's a tricky, tricky thing to want something so badly And then be able to let it go. The more we want something, the harder it is to let go. But it's counterintuitive, counterintuitive. When we're willing to let go, 
we have a better chance of getting exactly what we desire most. So that's what's so amazing. But because of the counter intuition, because of this aspect, it's one of the hardest things we'll ever be able to do. By the way, the human brain does not want to let go. Once that fear mechanism is triggered, fight, flight, or freeze, it's going to hang on desperately to what we th- we want so badly. In other words, consciously we have to say, no, hang on, let me think about this. I have to be willing to let go, not be attached, have no expectations, and believe that if it's meant to be mine, it will be. And that's that whole beautiful cliche about if you want something, set it free, and if it's uh, meant to be yours, it shall be. I don't know, that was just my my version, but, you know, set it free, and if it's meant to be yours, it will come back, and it's so freaking true. So, I've had to really deal with this in my own life over and over again lately, and be reminded of this. So, I felt the need to do a podcast about this because... It is the thing that will botch up everything. It's, it, it, ugh. The closer we get to whatever it is we want and desire and wish for. This is also part of that, you know, three feet from gold. Giving up just three feet from the treasure. You know, most human beings will give up three feet from the treasure because it's our brain that gets in our way, meaning it will, the neuronal patterning patterning from childhood will take precedent, that it's not worth it. I never deserve it. I'm not good enough. It's not meant to be mine. Too good to be true. All these disempowering thoughts from childhood will show up and try to just put us back to what has historically been our patterns in life. And if we look backwards and we're courageous enough to admit it, we'll see one thing after another we were so close to achieving and yet it fell through and yet it fell through and yet it fell through and so if we're able to really take responsibility for that and really dig deep to see what is really the cause and why and where the fear comes from and how we're sabotaging ourselves how we're getting in our own way we're becoming our own worst enemy in our minds then we have the power to stop the insanity. We have the power to do, first of all, not just do, more importantly, to be complete opposite and to do complete opposite, which is the counterintuition. Is, for example... When I was going through manifesting my horses, I mean, I can tell you, I have these three horses with me today. My black stallion, there was drama, the little mini drama, but my beautiful Arabian mare, no drama. I wasn't attached to her so much. I could take her or leave her. I even had her picture on my dream board at one point, I never had a picture of a mini horse or a black stallion because it was etched in my mind. I didn't need a picture. It was already in my head. That's how attached I was to it. But her picture was on there and then all of a sudden she showed up out of nowhere. I mean, I met one woman one time who was referred to me 
by another woman I barely knew. She told me about this horse in Palos Verdes. I called up and I said, I don't need another horse, but I called him anyway. I drove down to Palos Verdes, took a look at her. She ran around in the, in the arena and I said, okay, I'll take her. He trailered her up to my house. I wasn't even living here at the time. I show up on the weekends and there she was frolicking beautifully in my pasture. And that horse, that was like easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl. There was no drama. There was nothing because I wasn't attached. I could care less. I could take it or leave it. I didn't have to have this horse. And as it turned out, she is my best, best trail horse. She is fire. She's my personality. She's the alpha. And she looks like a Barbie doll. I wanted a Barbie doll horse and I got her. Easily, effortlessly. I did nothing. And by the way, that horse was given to me. And I could have turned her around. She's grade A, pure Arabian, papered, registered. I could have turned her around and sold her for thousands of dollars. So that's how I know this is a thing. Because I live it day in and day out. The more I want something, the more I have to have it. The harder it is to get. There it is. Bam. In a nutshell. And then I go through all this pain and strife and dis-ease, disease, and then my hip gives out, and then my knee gives out, and then my I have tension in my trapezius muscle, and uh, I'm irritable and anxious and have all these symptoms. Oh my gosh, when will I learn? Well, great question. We learn through experience. When I sit back and go, okay, this is happening for a reason. There's more drama. I must be attached. I must be attached somewhere. I must need to have this happen for some reason. To prove that I'm worthy. To prove that I'm good enough. To prove that I know what I'm talking about. And to prove that magic does exist. To prove that... When I say something's going to happen, if it doesn't, people are going to think I'm crazy. It's all to prove that I'm worthy and that I know what I'm doing and that I'm not just preaching crap. And so what ends up happening is when... We are in the need to prove. We are in the need to make sure it's enough. And we're trying not to look bad or be embarrassed or humiliated. We're actually in fear underneath it. There's the fear. And when that fear is activated, it's insidious and it idles invisibly. And that fear then takes precedent and it cancels out our ability ability to be logical and rational. And then we create blind spots. We can't see logically, rationally, what has historically worked. And how to not be diseased, diseased. We lose sight, literally, figuratively, of what will have us regain our power, our enthusiasm, our energy... And our beliefs to actually achieve the very thing we set out to. That all goes away. So when I think, oh gosh, I can't handle this. Too good to be true. It's too much. And I'm in fear of not believing that I'm worth it. And that it's meant to be mine. Then I can't see all the times that it has worked over and over and over again like clockwork. I miss all the good stuff. I miss going, oh yeah, my Barbie horse. When I got her, I wasn't attached at all and she just showed up. It was so easy. It, it was like so mysterious and mystical. It's, it's virtually unbelievable. And yet there she is in my pasture walking around. That's the horse you'll see. I ride up to the top of the hill, take videos, take pictures. That's her. And um, interesting, her registered name is Abounding Beauty. And she is a spitfire. And she's just so beautiful and sweet. But 
Um, she has a very strong will and she's the boss. <laughs> so I have to recall all the times it has worked. I have to remember to tell myself and be reminded over and over again that I'm attached for some reason. I'm looking to prove something. I'm trying to not humiliate myself. I'm trying not to fail. I'm trying not to fail and F it up. That's really what attachment is, is the need to not fail. So then we have to somehow override that by achieving the goal. Otherwise, we're going to feel really bad. And I have to remind myself about this over and over again and also remind all of you that do not give up. Do not stop. If it's something that you feel intuitively or your gut says or your highest knowing knows that it's meant to be, stick with it, but let it go. I call it temporary amnesia. You have to forget about it. You have to just let it go and virtually forget, and that's when it will show up. And the sooner we can forget that we want it so badly to prove something, the sooner it shows up, meaning... At some level, we do have to tell ourselves, oh, it wasn't meant to be right now. There's something greater on the other side, something more unbelievably miraculous and magical that's going to show up out of this when I just let go and allow divine intervention to take place, divine timing and regain my power in terms of knowing that I don't need anyone or anything outside of myself to be happy, to prove anything, to be worthy, to be self-respectful. I don't need anything. I just need me to believe in me. And it's icing on the cake to have other people believe in you. You know, For the most part, I had very few outside critics, but I did have some big ones in my own family. You know, the big thing I thought of when I was in high school, I remember hearing from one of my siblings that my parents somehow had it, you know, don't tell Karen she's any good, it will go to her head. Okay, you know what? That was complete opposite. Again, counterintuitive. That's the very thing that was missing is learning to believe in me and have my parents encourage me and support me. I did not have that. So it would have helped out a lot. Probably, I'm going to say not even probably. This is a big reason why I was so depressed. And I had no reference points for believing in myself. Now, I have come to know, which I learned and trained for, is loving myself, regardless of what anyone else says, thinks, or does. But as far as critics go, um, I clearly have been my own worst enemy, my own worst self-hater, my own worst self-sabotageur and saboteur, Um, so it doesn't really matter. We'll have people on the outside, you know, telling us it's not going to work or we're no good. Eh, forget it. It's really the person on the inside, me, that was the worst on myself. Now, also, people who are telling you you're no good or it's not going to work, you got to watch out for those vampires on the outside. But my point is, it will always come down to the, our inner self because if we believe them, that's where we get in trouble. So you don't want to hang around naysayers. Do not do that. Just saying. But I know for myself that being my own worst enemy was literally, figuratively, the death of me. And the root cause for my self-sabotage. And creating the self-fulfilling prophecy wheel 
of self-destruction. And, and um, you know, loneliness, emptiness, meaninglessness in my life. Okay, so wrapping it up here. This is all about wanting something so desperately and being willing to let it go and let go of the desperation and the wanting and the need. The more we're able to let go, the more powerful we become and the faster it actually happens in our favor. And we can never lose. If it doesn't come back around, but you can see that to hang on so desperately isn't serving you, you win. You win, you win, you win. Nothing in life is worth it to suffer, to live in this, oh, I can't have it, I'm depressed. Oh, I can't have it, I'm sad. Oh, poor me. It's not worth it. Here's why, ladies and gentlemen, because unfortunately, we die. This time around in the human form is temporary. The only thing that's guaranteed once we're born is death in the human form. I believe vastly in spirit world. But in the human form, we're dead as a doornail. So there is an expiration date. There is a time limit. So we have to think to ourselves very clearly, if we only have a certain amount of time on this planet, do we want to waste one nanosecond? There's another second even smaller than that, but I forget the name of it. But for right now, do we want to waste any measure, the smallest measure of time, in sorrow, sadness, dis-ease, disease, and unhappiness, unfulfillment, emptiness, loneliness, meaninglessness. Do we want to do that? No, 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 no. Don't do it. Take it from me. I've done it my whole life and how much I've missed out on. All meant to be. I had to go through all of it to become wiser and more enlightened and evolved But I'm here to say, you know, if I could teach you something, words of wisdom that would shortcut your dreams coming true sooner than later, I'm going to do that. Because I do feel that if I can share my wisdom and enlightenment with you, that it would be making humanity better, more evolved, more enlightened, more loving more compassionate, more empathetic, more generous and of service to others. But we can only serve others to the degree in which we serve ourselves, not in a selfish way, but in a self-loving way. So that's what I want you all to get here. Oh, actually... My ability to share all of this from my own experiences with all of you helps me so much. So I appreciate all of my listeners, even if it's just one listener. But you know, even if nobody's listening, when I speak it out loud, I actually get something for myself here. I actually listen to the things I say now out loud (laughs) only because I've trained so hard to say things that help me. This is about me helping and empowering you through me, my experiences, my life, what has worked and what has not worked at all. So that said, if you have any comments or questions, you can always message me uh, or email me at karenlovelee at gmail. And you can always find me uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, but if you hashtag Karen Love Lee, K A R E N L O V E L E E, if you Google that, I'll show up. And, um, but if you are interested at all in a private consultation for private elite coaching, please message me 
and email me and I am happy to set up a complimentary call to uh, connect with you and help you in any way that I can to see if we're a match for private empowerment coaching. And if not, I am happy to speak with you and connect with you anyway. And thank you all so much for listening. And if you're able to rate my podcast, uh, five stars, of course, (laughs) and give positive feedback, this is my public service message. The podcasts are free. And my intention is to share the wealth, share the spirit, share the wealth, and have all of you become spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially healthy, wealthy, and wise. And with that, may all your dreams come true and that you live a magical fairy tale life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and I love you all.